Ready? Steady? Strike! <laughs> a blindfolded warrior swung his blade with one powerful strike, and just before the offender could scream, with his head stuck out of a drum, the blade had landed on his neck, offering a seamless clean cut, and his shoulders set free of its headly burden. The king cheered in excitement with a loud voice, holding a jar of the king's mead in his hands. As the victim's lifeless head hits the ground, King Kalu the Great, also known as Kingslayer, his reign was marked by two words, death and conquest. In a span of 12 years, Kalu has won 10 battles, taken over nine cities, and set his loyal men as legislators over them. His army of 150 unbeatable warriors were rumored to be immortals because their strength was unmatched by any army. Their skills and tactical attacks left every army defenseless. But even with such immense victory, Kalu wasn't satisfied. His goal was to stretch his reign as far as the eyes could see. His quest for power and dominion was insatiable. He became very pompous and proud. He started exhibiting cruelty to anyone that dared to question him. To King Kalu and his men, blood flowed as easily as water. Their disregard for life made them invincible in battle their blades thirsting for blood. Yet, even amidst his triumphs, a hunger gnawed at King Kalu's soul, a hunger for realms yet unconquered. Kalu woke up one morning with a burden in his heart. My brave warriors, our next goal is something unspoken of. Let's conquer the seas and ocean kingdoms beyond the realms of mortal men. Tomorrow we sail for the great Bermuda. His men yelled in excitement at his words. King Kalu, we will follow you to the ends of the earth, even into hell. King Kalu and his men went on a voyage and headed towards the renowned Bermuda portal, which in those days was the entrance into the kingdom of the seas. The entrance of the Bermuda was known for its treacherous spiral whirlpool. Just before they dived in, the king brought out a special glowing plant found only by the entrance of the portal and shared it to all his men. The enchanted leaf could allow the men to breathe, speak and walk comfortably underwater for several days. One by one, they took a deep dive into the depths of the sea. They came up on a giant gate that led into the kingdom. The underwater kingdom was a sight to behold, with enchanting colors and a serene atmosphere. They noticed a cave not far from the entrance with an inscription above it that reads, The Gatekeeper. Leading his men, Kalu walked into the cave stealthily as the doors were left open. They were welcomed by the cries of Merbabees from within. They walked in and found three of them unattended to and crying loudly. King Kalu burst into laughter. What powerful city would leave their infants as gatekeepers? He scornfully joked to his men as he pointed at the infants. Kill these noisemakers, he ordered his men, as they carried out the order. Their cries echoed through the water, and a deep silence cut through the waves. Beaming with accomplishment, Kalu turned to the door, but was frozen at a strange sight in front of him. An oversized mother of the Merbabees they had just executed. Her form enormous as she stood three times the size of the king. Her eyes were fumed with rage and turned red as she stared at King Kalu and his men. As her rage grew, she released an immense ear-piercing scream, 
its force and vibration instantly dismembering the whole of Kalu's warriors as they stood around him, except the king himself. Please spare my life, Kalu begged and pleaded. King Kalu of the land of Obudu, so you fear to die, but took no pity for mine. Oh, you will not just die. I promise you, King Kalu, I will make you feel pains like no living man has ever felt. You will pray for death, and when I eventually allow you to die, generations will cry at the remembrance of your name. In a distant kingdom ravaged by hunger and poverty lives a beautiful maiden named Serena. She had a sister named Adama. Their father, Okeg, had lost their mother to the cold hands of death and got married to a new wife. One evening, Serena walked into the room to meet both of her parents talking in hushed tones. She sensed the tension in the air and asked what the matter was. They hesitated to respond and she insisted, focusing on her mother, who opens up to Serena about a letter from another kingdom in search of a wife for their son. And in exchange, the wealthy kingdom will enrich them with food, gold and supplies. Serena hesitated, but her father pleaded with her emphasizing the need for their engagement and how it will help the kingdom to survive hunger and hardship. After a long thought, Serena accepted, but worried if he would be kind to her or accept her. The next morning, they set sail for the land of Umuagu. After a long journey through the sea, they arrived in the kingdom of Umuagu, it was adorned with great statues of gold and other forms of luxury that Serena and her family had never seen before. They marveled at the palace walls which were adorned with all forms of precious stones and enamels. They were welcomed by the king's men at the gate and led them to their quarters. That night Serena couldn't sleep and came out of the balcony to view the beautiful kingdom. In the distance, she saw a swirling in the sea, curious but careless, and continued with other beautiful sights. She finally went to bed. The next day, she saw her prince, and they got talking. Their marriage was slated for the following day. The queen of Umwagu had a meeting with Serena's father to discuss on dowries and settlements. Serena's stepmom stumbled into them just immediately after they finished. She inquired how the meeting went, and he said fine, but with a strange look on his face. She insisted he told her what was wrong, but in anger he shouted fine that he didn't want to be bothered. She immediately sensed that something was wrong she ran to Serena and told her this wedding was a big mistake. Before she could continue, Serena's father stepped in and told her to leave her alone to rest for the big day. That the next day, Serena got married to her prince in a grand and lavish wedding. The prince then informed his new bride they have to go and pay homage to their ancestors. This got her excited. Getting to the seashore by the mountain caves, she saw strange men and women from the kingdom, but they all wore a golden mask. She got really scared and asked the prince what was all this and he answered and said, all is well, my princess. The village chief priest, holding a knife, told Serena, in order to be part of the royal blood she has to cut herself, and also the prince, and both of their blood must join together while holding hands. In addition to this, she had to drink a green goose from a bowl, which tasted awful. This terrified Serena, but looking at the prince, he nodded and said, everything is fine. 
This didn't take long and the ritual was done and she was now declared a royal blood. As part of the ritual ending, the prince has to carry her on his arms out of the cave. So he told her not to worry and she should lay her head on his shoulder. She smiled and did as he had said. Midway out of the cave, beside a pit that led down to the underwater cave system, he told her, Serena, I'm very sorry. She immediately opened her eyes to ask what he was sorry for, but this was too late. He tossed her into the opening. Serena screamed, but her screams were quickly drowned as she fell into the deep. As Serena sank further into the water, due to her heavily adorned dress which was done intentionally, thoughts raced through her mind. Soon she found herself in a caravan under the sea, with passages leading in various directions. Fear gripped her as she looked around to figure out where to start her escape. Then with the side of her eye, she could see something moving fast. She turns around and sees a scary mermaid speeding in her direction and quickly dives into one of the caves. She sees an opening and tries to follow through, but again the mermaid attacks her and scratches her arm with its claws. The mermaid's voice rumbled through the caves. You can hide all you want, but you will eventually die. Many other princesses before you have come through this, and it always ends up the same way. She went towards the edge and saw writings of names on the walls. There were over 15 names scattered around the cave walls. She entered inside another one of the chambers within the cave, and her hand mistakenly touched a skull laying nearby. Immediately she goes into a trance. In her trance, she sees a maiden who tells her, It is all a lie. The king is deceiving the creature. Her trance ended as soon as it started. In fear, she struggles through the cave and gets to another side. She found a hidden tunnel within the caves, with thorn-like rocks encircling it, and a rope hanging down. She carefully grabbed onto the rope and ascended the tunnel. She follows the rope till she comes up at the top of the cave and sees the sun. Back at the kingdom, the queen notices there was no blood in the waterfalls coming out of the mountain of sacrifice, which means the princess had not been killed by the mermaid. In anger, she storms out of her palace with guards heading to where Serena's family was lodged. The door of their abode flung open as the angry queen with her guards stormed in. Your daughter has escaped and we don't have time for any games. You promised us a daughter and we must have one. Guards take the lad. The guards grabbed Adama and stormed out leaving their mother crying. Not too long, Serena's father showed up and was told what had just happened. This wasn't our agreement, he yelled as he left his wife. He immediately contacted and paid a local fisherman who was familiar with the caves and waters, making a pact that he must ensure he finds his daughters. The queen and her guards dragged Adama to the cave for the ritual as they did with Serena. The prince was hesitant to participate but his mother, the queen, without a word, gave herself a cut and joined her hand with that of the little girl. Before anyone could react, the queen pushed her into the waters as they had done with Serena. The mermaid, sensing a new royal blood in her waters, immediately went after her new sacrifice. After a short chase, she caught up with Adama and took her to her altar of sacrifice. Serena, now free from the caves, noticed the boat about to leave the shores and screamed to the captain. 
her mother sees her and runs to meet with her, informing her that her sister had been forcefully taken away as well. This angered Serena, who promises her mother that she will have her sister rescued. She grabbed a sword from one of the soldiers, ran back and dived into the waters. The mermaid holding Adama close told her, your sister will come back for you. I'll have her heart first and then yours. Serena moved with purpose, knowing her sister's life was on the line. She swam swiftly and gracefully through the waters, now familiar with the caves she once escaped from. But as she drew close, she heard a familiar voice calling out to her and her sister. She could spot three men in the clear waters at the far side of the giant cave. Serena was about to respond when she immediately noticed the mermaid swimming towards the men. In an instant, she struck the locale who came with Serena's father and was about to strike her father. I have come to get my daughters, he spoke up. The mermaid, sensing Serena's presence close by, quickly overpowered him and instructed him to call out to Serena and have her reveal herself. He thought quickly and yelled out Serena's name and instead told her to run away and save herself from this monster. The mermaid angrily struck him down, Serena witnessing the death of her father. She distracted the mermaid, went through another cave and returned to her father, who was lying down about to die. While she tried to revive him, the mermaid appeared from behind her and struck a fierce blow. Serena pulled out her sword and spoke to the mermaid. You are being lied to. But the furious mermaid was not in the mood for any negotiations and charged towards her. Serena wielded her sword carefully and landed a fatal cut on the tail of the mermaid. She let out a very loud painful cry and laid still staring at Serena, who was holding a sword to her head. Fed up with all the years of pain and killings, the mermaid asked Serena to end it all. Kill me now and be quick about it. This all ends here and now. Serena raised her sword to kill the mermaid, but instead she struck the sword to the ground and told the mermaid, they have lied to you all these years. She explained to the mermaid that all the maidens the king had been sending her to kill were not born princesses, but they were taken, deceived, and had their blood fused with one of the royals to give them the blood of royalty. At this point, the mermaid understood everything, and fury burned through her entire body. Her entire body glowed, her cut tail slowly regenerated and grew back out. They must pay for their deceit, she said to Serena. King Kalu killed my three Mbabis and for decades have been sending me the daughters of other men to kill in his place. Today his kingdom will fall and his reign will be no more. And raising up her hand, the four winds of the seas combined and formed a gigantic wave on the sea. The mermaid controlled the giant wave towards the kingdom. Meanwhile, the queen and his family was in the middle of conducting another marriage in the palace, initiating another peasant into royalty to use for another sacrifice when suddenly they saw a huge wave taller than the kingdom's pinnacle. They screamed in terror, but it was too late to escape, as the wave engulfed the entire kingdom, drowning everyone. The evil rulers who, with their flamboyant gifts, deceived poor kingdoms and sacrificed their daughters, were wiped out. Serena reunited with her mother and sister, 
and together went back to their village. The story teaches us the dangers of unchecked ambition and arrogance, as an insatiable quest for power could lead to destruction. Ultimately, this tale serves as a reminder that every action has consequences, underscoring the importance of mindfulness and righteousness in one's pursuits.